so you don't need them for just just for a moment. But I I just want to start by by saying I don't, I don't really know why I'm here. <laughs> I don't deserve to be here. I've done nothing in my life at all to claim any credit for whatsoever. And yet God still somehow picks up something as useless as me and stands me here and says, go and talk to these people about prayer. You know, I, in chess, you have chess grandmasters, don't you? These incredibly dedicated, serious, you know, absolutely fantastically agile minds, incredibly complicated thinking to get all the moves and all the rest of it, you know, fantastic, you know? Well, I can tell you, we're talking about prayer this morning, and I, I am not a grandmaster of prayer by any stretch of the imagination. And so what we're going to do is just share with you, I'm just going to share with you some of my experiences too, and a little bit of what the Bible has to, to teach us about prayer. And this is the first in our series on growth. You'll remember the other week we talked about the fact that as we step um, our, our society is, is, is very slowly, but sometimes quickly, it's really lost its core Christian centre. It's lost the truth of, the Christ, of, of, of God, and it's lost the core moral values of the Christian faith. And as a result of that, as Christians, we, we, we stand and we live and we serve in an increasingly hostile um, uh, environment that doesn't re uh, even even recognise the value anymore of our faith of, of of Jesus being special or different from Buddha or Muhammad or anybody else who stands up and pretends to be a guru of some description, and so growing stronger in our relationship with God, it for me is an essential thing that we've got to be thinking about at this time, and so we're going to go through. A growth series and they the growth is a little bit contrived but nevertheless G is to go in prayer R is to read your Bible O is to be obedient to God W is to witness T is thanksgiving and positiveness in everything that we are and H is about having fellowship and supporting and caring for one another so that's where we are so there's three parts to this morning and the first part is a very, very quick resume of something that we shared, uh, I don't know, six months or so ago, which uh, describes the, the type, the different sort of types of prayer that there are. The second is to look at the Bible verses on the sheet, <coughs> because whatever we teach, we need to go back to our scriptures and we need to understand what the Bible is teaching us, because that's where we find our truth. And then thirdly, uh, is a bit about relationship, which the guys have already touched on a little bit in their testimonies uh, earlier on. So first of all, I'm just going to mention again that when we pray, there are different way, things that we pray for. And one way of helping you, if you're never sure how to even begin to pray, sit down in front of God, like, what am I going to pray for? Sometimes there are things so urgent, you know what it is. Other times you sit with a, an empty mind. We can adore God. We can confess to God. We can give thanks to God. And we can supplicate, we can ask for things. And that is an acronym, A-C-T-S. A for adoration, just enjoying who God is and worshipping him for his greatness and his majesty. You know, and it's something, that's something we don't do enough of. Because if you really begin to think about God, the power behind the universe, you know, God is something just beyond our imagination. And so to be able to stop and to recognise him in all his glory and greatness and the power that a click of the fingers creates a universe. That's pretty amazing stuff. So why wouldn't we want to come and just adore and recognise that greatness? Confession is about the fact, well, he's so great and I'm so inadequate. <laughs> and, I, you know, whenever I come into God's presence, one of the things I always recognise is I've got to start somewhere about saying, I'm sorry, Lord, the last 24 hours hasn't been a good one. I've done this and I've done that, etc. And just seeking that forgiveness and repenting of things that aren't quite right. The third thing is about thanksgiving, and we'll come back to that in some of the Bible verses, but it's about thanking God for the forgiveness he gives to you, but also for all the blessings that you enjoy. But if you started writing them on a piece of paper, I'll guarantee you'll have sheets and sheets before you finish. You know, you can thank God for the house, you've got a roof over your head. You can thank God this morning that you've got food in your belly. You can thank God this morning you've got clothes on your back. You can thank God this morning that you've got a church family here that you can come to. You can thank God that you've got a GP that you can go to when you're sick. You can thank God that you've got this, that, there's so much, you know, there's water running out of your tap. There's food in the supermarkets. You've got a car to drive. You don't go a bike to ride. 
There are so many things that we should be giving thanks for. The list is endless. And yet we take so much of what we have and enjoy, in this country particularly, where we're relatively wealthy compared with the world, so much for granted. And then S is about supplication, which is about asking. So I won't tell you more on that. It's obvious, isn't it? Um, someone has a problem, you pray for them. You have an issue to resolve, you pray, ask, ask God's help to do it. You just begin to lay the issues and the problems of yourself and the world and your family and so on around and ask God to become involved in them. So ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Suffocate, just different ways of beginning to become involved with God in prayer. But I'd like to look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to, to offer. So have a look at the sheets uh, in front of you. And you'll see that there are five thing, five aspects down the left-hand side. Humility, rejoicing, the Holy Spirit, sorry, four, not five. Humility, rejoicing, the Holy Spirit, and confidence and belief. So let's start with the two on humility. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. When you pray... Go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen, and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And in Chronicles, a very famous verse if you've been around in the Christian church for years, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. The journey to our land being healed begins with us being humble in the presence of God. We have nothing to bring to God other than our lives and to lay them down in front of him. Humility is really important. I don't know about you, but I've, over the years, going back in Cardiff and oh, everywhere I've been, um, every so often, you know, you come across the individual who prays constantly in prayer meetings and dominates them. And goes on and on and on and on. And sometimes I wonder about that. Sometimes it's genuine enough, I suppose, but other times I wonder about this verse. And I've never been one for worrying about the words that I use. <clears throat> My prayers haven't got to be fancy. I haven't got to be educated and use long words. I can simply say, God, I need your help. And in that point of humility, God already knows where that help is required. We don't need long-winded prayers to be able to engage with our Father. Because prayer, fundamentally for me, is not about what we say. It's about the state of our heart and where that heart is in submission to God, our Father. And when we are humble and open before him, then the words don't matter because God sees our heart. He knows what's on our minds. So don't worry about words. Don't feel you've got to be eloquent. Um, it's just not important. Gabble it away. Do whatever you like. As long as your heart is true and open to God, then he's already there involved in the issue that you're trying to express. Humility. The second is rejoicing, and this is such a key principle when it comes to the Christian life. And we will come back to it in the growth series a little bit later on when we get to the tea of thanksgiving. In Philippians, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. So it doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it, or rejoice in the Lord when you've had a good day. Or rejoice in the Lord when Everton win a home match in football, which I know they haven't done for a long time, Kevin. You know, it's 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 not about it's not about when you choose to rejoice, it's to rejoice always and humble themselves. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And in Thessalonians it says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. And the biblical story that always comes to mind when I, when I think of this is Paul and Silas in prison in Acts 16. They've been beaten up by the mob, they've been, 
they'd been uh, uh, bruised and bloodied, and there they were shackled in a dark prison with no attention, no one be, uh, tending their wounds. And what were they doing? They sang hymns to God. They worshipped their God in the midst of their physical pain and deprivation. We so often these days get anxious about there's a bill we can't pay or there's a sickness that we don't, we, we don't know what to do with or there's an issue with our workplace or our children are there some issue there, whatever it is. We can worry about the economy, we can worry about all sorts of things. We rejoice, according to the Bible, in all circumstances. Even in the darkest place in your life, you are called to rejoice because rejoicing is an expression of your trust in God. Do you trust in God to be in your dark place? If you do, then you should be rejoicing because God is in your dark place. And if God is in your dark place, what's the only outcome? A tunnel always has an ending. There's always light at the end of a tunnel. It's just a question of getting there. It's a journey. Sometimes you journey through the darkness and through the pain, but God always leads us to a point of salvation, of restoration, of positiveness, of, re of restoration, of healing, of something that reflects his nature and his kingdom and his wholeness and his purpose for your life. There is nothing in this world that we should fear of. It says, doesn't it, do not be anxious about anything. The principle of rejoicing in all circumstances, I think is very key about prayer. Because when we come before God, we can come with confidence. And we'll come on to that uh, in a minute. Because God is in control. He, we have adored him. He is the king, the universe creator, and his power is supreme over everything else. Uh, then there's a couple of verses on the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray. Well, I'm definitely in that club. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And in Ephesians, it tells us, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and petitions. One of the things that, that I have found in my life is that when I received the gift of speaking in tongues many years ago, I suddenly found that when I didn't know how to pray for people, I could pray for them by speaking in tongues. It was the Holy Spirit could take what I was feeling in my heart and in my mind and could express it in prayer at the feet of the Father. Sometimes somebody says, oh, can you pray for somebody? And they've got a problem, they're going into hospital. We say it here very often, don't we? The somebody, I don't know. I, I might never have seen them. I'll join in the prayer because that's what we're about. But sometimes, if I don't know them, I can't be precise. So I let my heart desire for them and their well-being express itself as I focus on God the Father and let the Spirit do the, literally do the talking. There are times when the Spirit will take what you feel inside, even though you can't express it. If you're looking at God when you're before him, he understands your feelings and emotions and the Spirit will take those feelings and emotions and will help you as you pray. As you yearn for something in God's presence, then effectively that yearning is a prayer that the Spirit will take and lay at God's feet. So it's not about words. It's also about allowing the Spirit to flow through us and about sometimes when we fail with words of just saying, Lord, I have this desire, here it is, this desire for this person to be well and allowing the Spirit to take that desire and lay it at the feet of God. And the last thing is about confidence and belief. In 1 John 5, it says, This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, we can ask for anything. Whether he answers it in the way we want is an entirely different question. But there is a confidence that when we come into the presence of God, however we come into the presence of God, he is our Father and he is willing to listen to what we share. 
and we have this assurance that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So it's unlikely if I ask him, you know, for a Rolls Royce to appear first thing Monday morning, that it's going to actually happen. On the other hand, if I pray for something that's more in accordance with his will, about the salvation of someone's soul or healing or something, then I'm more likely to see that as an outcome. So there is that question of being in God's will and purpose, you know. But when we ask with confidence, he hears and he replies. And in Mark it says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. It's about trust in the relationship. Which brings me on to relationship. And Dan and Ethan have both alluded to that uh, a little earlier on. You know, uh, when I first moved to Shropshire, my parents were still down in Cardiff. So I used to get in the car, I used to drive for two and a half hours, I'd knock on the door, they'd welcome me in, I would start talking to them and tell them about everything. I wouldn't let them get a word in edge, but I just talked and talked and talked and talked for an hour, two hours, three hours, and then I said, thanks, bye, I'm off again, got back in my car, drove another two and a half hours back here. My father and mother never got a word in edge. <laughs> Isn't that how we're like, that's tr not true, but for illustration purposes, aren't we like that sometimes with God? Don't we just come before him and we woof, we lay it all in front of him, and we rattle on for however long it is, and then we say, thanks God, and down da <laughs> to this about listening. And that's the, exactly the point. You know, prayer is about relationship. Dan again mentioned we are a child of God. One, uh, in John 1 verse 12, is it? Um, he gave us the right to be children of God. If we're a child and he's our father, then we are in a family relationship. And I'll bet your bottom dollar there's not one of you that when you see your parent, or if you're an elderly par uh, parent now and you have children, there's not one of you will have a relationship where only, if, if, where only one of you ever talks. If you do, then you're a bit sad, I'm afraid, and you need some counselling, so come and, come and talk to Rose and I afterwards and we'll push you in the right direction. But it's about relationship, isn't it? Families are about relationship. It's about talking and sharing and helping each other through difficulties. It's about enjoying things together and celebrating together. It's about sharing a meal together. It's about the whole of life and aspects of life shared and supportively encouraging one another. And our spiritual relationship with God is exactly the same. And that means there are times when we have to stop and we have to listen. And just being in his presence and enjoying that presence. So when we pray, however we pray, whenever we pray, just in recognising that you're in that relationship is a great place to start. And because it's a relationship, you know, I don't always, when my, my, both my parents have sadly passed away now, but when, uh, when, when, when I went to visit them, sometimes we'd just sit in the lounge and we'd, we'd sit there and have a cup of tea and, and talk or whatever. Other times we would go and do something. So the point, the thing about God can only be for my half hour in my bedroom first thing in the morning or for an hour here on Sunday morning is absolute nonsense. And again, Dan touched on it. It's about a relationship and God's with you wherever you go. So whether you're in work, whether you're driving your car, whether you're in school, whether you're at home, whether you're walking uh, down the Silken Way, whether you're swimming in the Caribbean Sea, whether you're on an airplane at 33,000 feet, whatever, wherever you are, God is with you. And so you can have that relationship, that family relationship, at any time, any place, anywhere. Some of you will remember, if you're of a certain age, of a certain advert. <laughs> Any time, any place. Can you remember? Someone, someone, someone tell me what it was for? Martini. Martini. Was it, it 1970s or 80s or something like that? I, I can't remember that. Um, any time, any place, anywhere. Get, let's just grasp that because it, it's, it's very much what Darren was talking about, you know? You drive in your car, you can still be aware of God's presence and you can still share things with him. Even if you're driving down and the vista in front of you is just fantastic, you can say, Wow, thank you for that. If there's something on your mind, you can be driving and you can still have that yearning of your heart. One of the things that I've found is that when I drive, I can speak in tongues. And I've, I've shared this with people in the past, and they've said, well, how on earth can you do that? Because you can't possibly be concentrating on driving when you're speaking in tongues. And my point is, 
that when you speak in tongues, your brain is not creating the words. So your brain is not engaged. When you speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit is placing the language into your vocal cords and producing it. So I can focus quite, com quite easily on the road ahead of me at the same time as I can pray in tongues. It's back to letting the Holy Spirit sometimes help us. And sometimes I don't even know what I'm praying for, but my heart is engaged with God in some, at, some, at some level. Uh, however that engagement is, then that's what the Spirit is doing, helping me to pray and to share. Jesus had, I don't know how many times, someone, someone better than a better biblical scholar than me would tell you how many times, but so often he went off on his own, didn't he? He went off on his own to get back to basics with God. Because he said, he also said, didn't he, I only do what I see the Father doing. So he was very keen to stay close to his father. And in all circumstances, where the circumstance, maybe the crowd that he'd been preaching had gone on top of him and he felt exhausted, he tried to find somewhere where he could just touch base with God. Checky was on, per on, 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 on message, as it were, and doing the right things and then able to face, step out and face his next mission in the world. And again, for us, there's that kind of pattern. There are times when we can just celebrate with God. There are times when we positively need to step out of the world and to focus, to regain our focus, um, our, our sense of mission in the world, and to get straight in our mind how, what God wants from us in whatever situation we find ourselves in. So finding time when you're driving is great. Finding time when you're on your own and you can focus is great. Finding time when we come together, as we're doing today, is great. Because we can share as a church family with one another and add weight to the strength of the prayer uh, as we lay the issues that we pray for before God. There are no rights and wrongs in prayer, I have discovered, um, which is just as well, because my prayer life is a bit chaotic at times. It can go all over the place. No rights or wrongs. And words are not the driver for prayer. It's your heart and its readiness to be laid down in front of God that is the driving force that generates the prayer and puts the meaning and the power into your prayer. The Holy Spirit comes alongside you and takes that strength of feeling and purpose and desire and can turn it into something magnificent in the kingdom of God. You can't do anything. But your heart, as it speaks to God, can be taken by the power of the Spirit, and God replies and responds. For me, I'm, I'm sort of in the camp that Dan's in, really, and, and Ethan's in. You know, I, I tend to be chatty. I'm not, I've never in my life found, uh, had the desire to get up at five o'clock in the morning and pray for two hours before breakfast. I'm not saying that's wrong. I wish I could. Maybe it would do my life a lot. But that's never, never been me, I suppose. I don't feel guilty about it, but I know some of the saints, you read the stories of some of the great saints of the church, and you find that that kind of dedication to prayer was at the centre of their lives. When I read those stories, it makes me feel guilty. And then I find myself putting a bit more effort in for a while and maybe even getting up a bit earlier in the morning. And then I find myself getting back to my old, old ways. Does God tell me off? No, he just tells me to try harder. He just wants to talk to me any time, any place, anywhere. And for me, that's the most important driver. <coughs> if he, you feel the need to pray for two hours before breakfast, go for it. If you feel the need, as I do sometimes, I can't get to sleep and it's two o'clock in the morning. You know, you can count sheep or you can go and get a cup of tea or you can do whatever you like. I find those times fantastic times for God to speak to me. I've now learned that when I'm awake at two o'clock in the morning, not able to sleep, I start talking to him rather than counting sheep. I go to God. And I'll give you an illustration. So often, the one, the one really most... It, it can be quite vivid sometimes. I have told this story before, so some of you know this story, but some of you may not have heard it. When Andrea and I were buying the house where we live now, one of the things, we wanted to live somewhere that was within walking distance of here. And we placed an offer in, and we were driving to the airport to fly to America to see my son. And the estate agent rang, and we got gazumped, quite substantially so. 
we decided that we weren't going to get into a bidding war, besides which the price was beginning to escalate too high. So we stopped at a service station and said, what do we do? There was only one other house in the area available at that time that needed a heck of a lot of work doing to it. Anyway, to cut long story short, I phoned the estate agent and said, is anyone else interested? Are there any offers in on that at the moment? And he said, no, there aren't. I said, okay, well, I'm about to get on the plane. We'll give it some thought. Got to the other side, crashed into bed. Because of jet lag, I couldn't sleep. So there I was, awake. And as I prayed, I could almost, it was so strong I could visualise it. But there was a six-figure number. It was like it was written on a wall, except it wasn't physically there, but I could visualise it. The following morning, uh, when I got up, I was checking my, my, my phone, as most of us do, um, catching up on things, and there was an email from the estate agent. He said, after our phone call, I checked with my client and asked him what his bottom line was. Um, and if you offer this amount, I think he'll accept it. It doesn't, uh, you know the outcome of the story, don't you? The figure I had seen was exactly the same figure that appeared in that email. Exactly the same figure. So we offered it, he accepted it, and we moved in. <laughs> Sometimes God comes to us in surprising ways, in surprising places, but I find, that, particularly for me, that's two o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep, is a very, very vivid time. I don't know why, it just is. And so often he'll speak to me about what to put in if, if now, you know, we were teaching or even what songs. Um, it's just a vivid time. I can't explain it, it just is. So maybe if you can't sleep, you try it. Instead of worrying about not sleeping, just start praying and talking to your father and let him take over. Eventually I get back to sleep and I wake up the following morning, I've never been tired, even though I might have been awake and talking to him for an hour or more or however long it was, I don't know. Every single time that's happened to me, I always wake up and I never feel tired. It's almost as if God wants me to spend that time with him and is forcing me to do it. One last thing I want to share, and that's about when we come together. And today is a good example, plenty of opportunity today. And that is sometimes God will want to speak to us and he will want to speak into the wider group. As we pray, sometimes we will get nudged. When we come into a prayer meeting, one of the things, again, it's a habit I've, I've sort of acquired. In most prayer meetings, I tend not to be that vocal at the outset of prayer meetings. And it's because I got into the habit of wanting to listen rather than to pray. Because a prayer meeting, when we come together as a group, is still a conversation with our Father. And it's a two-way thing. And even as a group, when we come together, we need to be ready to listen to what God has to say and speak into us. And so sometimes, sometimes I'll just open randomly open the Bible, look at a verse and, 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 and just focus on it and pray over it. Sometimes it'll just be a picture that appears in my mind, a concept which I begin to think about. <coughs> and I'll hold it onto it and God nudges me. If it's, if it's him, he'll nudge me. It's the only way I can describe it. There's just a, a certain element of compulsion about it. And I push it very often, I push it to one side, and then he'll nudge me again. On several occasions, he's used Roland to nudge me. Roland didn't know anything about it. He simply stood up and said, said a sentence of some description. There was a word in that sentence, or there was an element in that sentence that just nudged me, because it was exactly what I was just thinking. You know? If you want me to share this, God, then tell me how to. And Roland the silent said, I think someone's got something to share. <laughs> 30 seconds later, and you think, okay, okay, I've got the message, thank you. <laughs> the point is that God will speak into our midst. It's a two-way thing. Now, he can speak into you as an individual, but it means that if he's speaking to you and you feel it's for everybody, you've got to learn how to share it. And sometimes that can be a bit daunting. But it's not about words. It's about picking up the heart of God and what he wants. So if it's a picture, you don't even understand it, share it. If it's a word from the scriptures, share it. If it's a prayer, say something out loud. Challenge, even if it's an odd prayer, pray it. The point about being together is that 
the leadership of the meeting has a responsibility for discernment of what is going on. That's what the New Testament teaches us. And so there is a discernment that Romans and I and others who are mature in the faith can apply to a situation. So if it's a bit wonky, then we can do something about it. We've had the odd occasion here where we've been a little bit worried about something that's been said in a meeting. We've had to address it. But mostly you will find that what you're feeling is God prompting you to share. It's a word of knowledge. It's a message. It's a promise. It's something that God wants to share. So in our prayer session today, don't always look to be thinking about verbalising. Sometimes sit and listen and just let God speak to you. And if he speaks to you today, then share it. If you've never done it before, just step out in faith and share it. And remember, there's no rights or wrongs. Words are not important. You haven't got to be eloquent. It's about sharing God's will and purpose in the heart of God for the benefit of the church family. So prayer. Prayer is about that relationship with God. There are different ways to pray, different times to pray. The Bible teaches us things and not to do. It teaches us about being positive and rejoicing in all circumstances. But it teaches us that words in themselves are not important. And if we look at the sense of Jesus, we know it's important to always step aside and to recalibrate ourselves into the will of God. There are lots of things that we can do, and I'm no expert, I'm just sharing my own, my own experience with you this morning. But if God has just nudged you this morning as we've been sharing together, then please respond to the nudge. <coughs> God is nudging you for a reason. And whatever that reason is, is personal to you, but just respond to his nudge. God bless you. Pray. Pray always. Pray with a rejoicing heart and allow God to take your life for his glory and for his purpose. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.